members bill in 2009 and ethics minister Simon Lokodo were ecstatic. This is a victory for the family of Uganda, the, 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 the future of our children and certainly a triumph of our sovereignty as a country that got independence 50 years ago. Because I know any sensible person will take this positively and say, oh, these people have asserted their position, they have asserted their mind, and let's respect them as they are, and we continue relating. Those accused of aggravated homosexuality could face life imprisonment, while the first-time offenders could face up to 14 years in jail. The initial proposal for the death penalty was removed following criticism from the West. For the president, assenting to the anti-homosexuality bill has been like placing icing on the cake. The president has also condemned the Western powers for what he has called uncultured sexual practices, whereby he has also said that they have rejected African politeness. I'm Suhail Mugabe, NTV, State House, Entebbe. Now, Museveni's decision did not come without any consequences, because following that, the World Bank has postponed a 90 million US dollar loan to Uganda, which is equivalent to 255 billion shillings over the anti-homosexuality law that President Museveni recently signed. Now, the loan was intended to boost Uganda's health services. The new law enacted on Monday strengthens already restrict legislations within the penal code relating to homosexuals in the country. It allows life imprisonment as the penalty for the acts of aggravated homosexuality and also criminalizes the promotion of homosexuality. The law has been sharply criticized by the West with donors such as Denmark, Netherlands and the Norway cutting aid to Uganda. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has called the law atrocious. There is fears that the donor aid cuts could put Uganda's sluggish economy into a tailspin. Uganda Media Center spokesperson Ofono Pondo in a Twitter salvo towards the West said, Uganda can survive without aid. On Tuesday 25th, another piece of legislation that has already and that was recently passed into law on Tuesday has also made headlines this week as uh, like the anti-homosexuality law. The Prime Minister Mama Mbabazi on Tuesday told Parliament that Cabinet is considering reviewing the Anti-Pornographic Act. This was after members of Parliament raised concern about the alleged sweeping of women dressed in miniskirts. Both the social and mainstream media have been awash with reports of women dressed in miniskirt being stripped in areas of downtown Kampala. The reports have caused an uproar among many members of parliament who are demanding that the government sensitizes people on the law and directs police to apprehend those taking the law into their hands. For you to strip a woman who is wearing a mini skirt in your own standards is illegal. These idlers, these goons are taking advantage for them, they think it is, uh, they are going to have a party molesting women. But I can assure you, and I want to tell every Ugandan that this will not go on when talk with the police and no woman is going to be molested. Now the Prime Minister Amama Mabo says government is considering withdrawing the law for review. But the, but the Prime Minister said it, cabinet. It's a cabinet decision. And, and he explained, yeah. That you want to look at the law. Yes, so, you, that, uh, so are you going to withdraw it now and bring it back? You talk to the Prime Minister because this is a cabinet decision. Yes. During the debate on the alleged undressing of women in the capital, Speaker Rebecca Kadaga also asked the Attorney General to sensitize the public about the law. But the majority of members of parliament think the law does not need reviewing. Actually, the cabinet should not even do anything because, with what has appeared in the newspaper today, the women will start dressing decently from tomorrow onwards. Yes, but, but the victims are as men. They dress very provocatively. I think they will take a very good stand as we took on the issue of pornography. Selling bad material to children, showing bad videos in the video places or cinemas to young children who go there from secondary school. To me, I believe that one, the government should remain actually hard on it. First of all, 
the word miniskirt is nowhere in this law. It's not there. Dressed decently like a mother. But, but, but there are young not. girls who dress the whole breasts out, the, the, the slits is up to the waist, they make men not work well, under difficult situation, irresponsible and provocative dressing. I think you should focus also on talking to but the young know, girls to yeah, dress decently like, like you. Because why are you not putting on a, a slit? Why are you not putting on a miniskirt now? Because you know it is indecent. Well, well, the anti-pornography law that was overwhelmingly passed by parliament and has already been assented to by the president outlaws the exposure of sexual parts and sale of pornographic material. But Ethics Minister Father Simon Lokodo has given contradicting statements on whether the miniskirt is banned under the law. This is what he said on the 17th of February. If you dress in such a way that you irritate the mind and excite the people, then you are, you, 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 you are badly dressed. And this is what he said on Monday while taking questions on Take 5. I want to say that nowhere and at no time does the nomenclature miniskirt surface in the bill, okay, in the law for that matter. And um, I am only surprised that people have come up with miniskirts. The Anti-Pornography Act is meant to prohibit pornography, to establish the Pornography Control Committee and to prescribe its functions. Agnes Nandutu, NTV Parliament. Thank you very much, Agnes. Quite a very controversial act there, which is going to be reviewed. Now, moving on, Parliament this week exonerated Prime Minister Maman Babazi of a misappropriation of over 50 billion shillings in the Prime Minister's office. But former Permanent Secretary Pass Bijidimana, Account General Gustavo Bochi, Secretary to the Treasury Keith Muhakanizi, and others were not left off easily. They are to be investigated and prosecuted for misusing money meant for the Peace Recovery and Development Plan in Northern Uganda. Agnes Nandutu had that report. After four days of debating a report on the special audit investigations into allegations of financial mismanagement in the office of the Prime Minister, members of Parliament have exonerated Prime Minister Amama Mbabazi. Though the main report presented by the outgoing chairman of Public Accounts Committee, Wadri Cassiano, does not indict Amama Mbabazi, the minority report presented by Kalung West MP Joseph Seungu finds him culpable for failing to oversee his docket. But the NRM MPs overwhelmingly voted to let Mbabazi off the hook. That the Prime Minister be held responsible for overstepping his powers by exerting that, by that pressure on the Accountant General and after that led to loss of colossal sums of money and are open air. Don't forget. However, former permanent secretary in Prime Minister's office, Pius Vigirmana, former accountant general Gustavo Bochi, Secretary to the Treasurer, Keith Muhakanizi, among others from the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Uganda, are to be investigated and prostituted. Mr. Gustavo Bosch the, and Mr. Pius Kilimana be held responsible for diversion of funds from the Norwegian support to PRGP North account at OPM. That the Permanent Secretary had to own up his own mantle to carry his own cross because they mandated accounting officer who is supposed to ensure that he complies with the laws and regulations of accountability. Babaz was let off the hook, but many MPs, mostly from opposition, think Babaz should have taken political responsibility for failing to oversee his docket. There has been a minority report which was pointing out serious issues on the OPM. But for me, I'm not surprised about the way this decision has been taken. I mean, that's how we normally parliament does things. People lose their conscience. They debate. If you follow the debate, the way people are debating is not the way people are now voting on the motions. It's unfortunate that at night people sleep and they lose their conscience and they wake up in the morning and they are thinking it's so different, not even on earth. The report also recommends that the former principal accountant Geoffrey Kazinda in the office of the Prime Minister convicted of fraud should be investigated further. The special audit into the office of the Prime Minister was launched in late November 2011. Mr. Pius, you are aware 
that on 19th you telephoned the case, did you? I did. The ghosts in the Prime Minister's office keep haunting on. Now, we are going to take a short break, but this is what is coming after. Still ahead on seven days, end of the road. Interpol seeks the extradition of expelled MP Tony Kipoi from the DRC. And MPs call for industrial action as health workers go three months without pay. We take a short break and return with this and more stories. generations ago, the warrior Apoena from the Karawe tribe fell in love with young Antonia. When they returned to the Araguaya River with the young white girl carrying their child, they awoke Iaru's hatred. Raised away from the curse, Solano Rangel, the last descendant of Antonia and Apoena, returns to <laughs> a beautiful, mysterious woman. And her destiny is to fulfill the curse. Destiny River. On the next episode of Kitchen Delight. I don't want you to miss my beautiful breakfast that I'm making. We are playing with bread, we're making a toast, we're making sandwiches, and of course a beautiful tea. I'm going to use peanut that's a little crunchy. So to sprinkle a little bit more of the masala. Wow, look at that. Is that not beautiful and attractive? You see the tea is, is like, like pinkish. The lettuce, the delicious kitchen delight. Kitchen Delight. Welcome back from that show break and indeed we delighted that ruling not only sanctioning the removal of the lawmakers from the August House, but also ordering a by-election in the four constituencies. Maurice Ochoa had that report. On the third day of attempting to secure an appeal, the four rebel lawmakers breathed a sigh of relief when the Supreme Court granted However, the highest appellant court has granted them an appeal, which will commence on March 4th, 2014. This happened in the presence of their lawyer, Caleb Alaka. The court's decision to grant them an appeal threw the MPs into a fit of joy. <laughs> the appeal will now stay the execution of the orders of the Constitutional Court. It's going to determine whether or not the orders of the Constitutional Court are... The court stays the enforcement or implementation of the orders of the Constitutional Court. Theodore Sechikubo, Winfred Niwangaba argued that perhaps there is a gleam of hope in their pursuit of elusive justice. We come here to seek justice, the right of the court. Once the hearing commences, the lawmakers will be free to return to Parliament and continue to earn their emoluments. Maurice Chol, NTV. NTV will need to extradite expelled Buburo West MP Tony Kipo in Subuga, wanted by the police on theft charges. The director of Interpol Uganda and the former Buburo West MP Tony Subuga Kipoi was arrested, but the director of Interpol Asan Kasinje confirms he is under the custody of the Congolese police. I have been in touch with our ambassador to repatriation. The announcement comes a day after Kipoi was charged in absentia before the general court marshal in Makindi with aiding the commission of treachery. Given to court, 
he went to court and requested that he wanted to travel. He went ahead and retrieved his passport. After traveling, Tony Chipo in Suvuga was supposed to report back to court, but he never reported to court. And Botswana requested police to investigate a case in which Kipoi allegedly conned a woman of 80,000 US dollars, which translates to over 200 million shillings. Uh, purportedly that he, he was going to treat her eyes. He is, uh, I think, is a Sangoma or something. Interpol issues red notices if the persons concerned are wanted by national jurisdictions for prosecution or to serve a sentence based on an arrest warrant or court decision. Kipoi was 2013. He was later freed, but a string of cases from illegal confinement of South African nationals to alleged drug trafficking followed. We also have trafficking of drugs. His was continued after he missed 15 consecutive parliamentary sittings without a reasonable explanation and he was expelled 10 days ago. Kipoi will be extradited to Uganda in less than two weeks. Sudil Biarhanga, NTV. Thank you, Sudil. Now, Buikwe South legislator Dr. Lulu Mebaiga has called on medical workers across the country to lay down their tools over the delays in getting their salaries. MP says health workers have gone for three months. The country have gone without pay for three months. The MP, who also doubles as the shadow health minister, says the plight of the medics was discovered by lawmakers during a recent fact-finding mission. The legislator is now warning of a looming strike if the government doesn't pay the salaries soon. Health workers cannot put food to their tables. They cannot take their children to school. They cannot even treat themselves when they are sick. They are lethargic. They have lost energy. They are ill-motivated. So as Shadow Minister of Health and Shadow Cabinet, as opposition, we are supporting them. The lowest paid enrolled nurse and 230,000 added that they are working on sorting out the problem. The Health Ministry last year made proposals to substantially increase the salaries of health workers, but that proposal hasn't been implemented. 2.5 million for the starting salary for a doctor, we are proposing between 1.5 workers threatened to stage a strike if their pay wasn't increased. The health workers have now given the government a two-week ultimatum to pay their salaries or face a national strike. More research all in TV. That brings this week's seven days to a close. Thank you so much for your company. I am Solomon Serwanja with Maureen Nambalira. We now take a short break and I return with NTV at one. Do stay with us. NTV, turning on your world. Program Guide. Hey, Solano. If you were so loyal to my uncle, and you wish to continue to be the Goldstein's lawyer, I'll ask that you help me claim my inheritance without any noise or publicity. Well, there's that knee. A high kick, he taught that very well. Great Against Daniel Gita, who is not someone who you can take lightly. I want to show... A taste of home to Humphrey Kayange in London. A journey you can be part of. We're looking for 25 people to say Twende Kazi and join the Tasker 25 on this mission. Join me. Join me. Join me. Join me. Join me. Join us and be a part of Africa's most epic TV show. Twende Kazi. Tonight on NTV. Nga boli ntiwa mubalala. There's a moment in everyone's life. I gained some weight. I didn't say anything. When childhood ends and adulthood begins. For John and Wendy Savage.
counting the number of multinationals sitting up here. What about the three companies that announced their plans to launch last week? I say they're shortly. Me, I'd be looking to sell. At what price? More. Much, much more. I don't know who you are or how you know these things, but one thing I'm sure of, you're in the wrong job. Here, call me tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'd like to hear more from you. Are you ready for your big break? The East African, understanding the region. NTV, turning on your world. Good afternoon once again and a warm welcome to NTV at One. I am Solomon Serwanja and it's indeed a pleasure to have your company once again. We'll start at NTV at One with the headlines of the stories. A foreign-owned construction firm loses billions worth of property to thugs along the Mbara Katuna Highway. A group of HIV activists introduced a toll-free helpline to support HIV patients who fear getting cancelled in the face-to-face -face setting. Also coming up, Ukrainian authorities warn Russia of going to war if its troops intervene in its case. You are watching NTV at 1. Once again, thank you so much for joining us here on NTV at One. Now, Reynolds Construction Company, RCC, hired to repair the Mbarara Katuna Highway, has lost construction material amounting to over 2 million U.S. dollars to thieves in the southwest region. The company says that the theft will and is likely to delay the construction and completion of the 124-kilometer highway, which is the major link to Rwanda. Amin Hamoud, the project manager of Reynolds Construction Company, fears theft of construction materials could affect the repair of Mbara Highway, which began in 2011 and will cost 440 billion shillings. They steal here everything. They steal uh, diesel, they steal material, they steal uh, iron bear, everything. We fight with this issue because this issue, they affect uh, the budget and uh, the, we don't have any profit if uh, these things continue. The Ntungamo District Woman MP, Naomi Kabasharida, who was speaking at a function where an access road constructed by the company was handed over to the public, said such wrong elements are against development. <laughs> The Rizi region police commander Emot Agaptu says, whereas police has often tried to nip in the bad thefts, it is sometimes difficult because some employees in the company connive with thieves. You find that at times some become very technical because some could be an organized theft inside which needs the volunteering of information from inside with the outside persons. However, Buheju MP Ephraim Bidaro, who is the chairman of the House Committee on Physical Infrastructure, commended the construction company for a job well done. It is a bonus to your appraisal. So if the next time you do bidding, whoever is doing the evaluation should take about that bonus. Okay. 
Now moving on, a group of HIV activists advocating for an end to stigma attached to the disease have introduced a toll-free helpline to support HIV patients getting counseling without having to meet a physician. The initiative called the Support and Life Through Telephone Helpline is spearheaded by the Forum for People Living with HIV and AIDS. Two times in a Hello, thank you for calling Salt Helpline. Who am I speaking to? Okay. So, how many clients call like in a day, in a week, you know? Yeah, in a day we can have around 48 clients calling in from all the regions. Basically, what do they like always want to talk about? They always call in to find out do we offer services or are we in touch with people whom they need maybe where they can go and get support or counseling or like even to pick the ARVs. Do you always have that information? Because these are people who are relying on you. Yeah, we do have most of the things that they ask because some of them you find the information they want to know is where can I go for testing? What can I do before I go for testing? And which information we can give? And the good thing about this is clients don't work. The only thing they need is to charge their phones. Once they have charged their phones, then they just call in. Simple as that. What's Free of number? charge. Our number is 0 800 Well, I think that helps stop the stigma attached to HIV and AIDS. Now, moving on, over 10 people in Buburo West constituents have expressed interest in becoming the area MP of Parliament. Tony Kipoi for missing 15 consecutive sittings. Kipoi was arrested by Congolese security agents in the eastern parts of the DRC last week and is expected to be extradited to Uganda. He is wanted at the Nakawa Chief's Magistrate's Court for jumping bail on charges of stealing a car from Botswana. The former Secretary General of Uganda, Red Cross, Michael Nakata, is among the people aspiring to replace Kipoi. Mentally, this constituency has been misrepresented for a while. If you go around in this constituency, most people have very fond memories of more than 15 years ago. So for about 15 years, the representation has not been so effective to such an extent that there are many things that one would see that are needed. I have four things that I want to embark on. One is uh, education. Education, you've seen the performance is not so good. Although it is improving gradually, I cannot bring heaven to earth, but I'll be doing what I can. The key areas that I want to build on is to improve communication between the people and, and, my, and, and the parliament. Education. As a lawyer, I believe I'm the right candidate to shed and effectively contribute to what is lacking in that constituency. Candidates right there gearing up to replace Kipoe in Buburo West. Now moving on, a Jiga, a Jiga epidemic has devastated several people in school in Namaingo district, forcing pupils to drop out of school. Most of the schools affected are uh, those under the universal primary education. Over 90% of pupils at Bulamba Primary School in Namaingo Town Council have been affected by a Jiga epidemic. The pupils have Jigas in their toes, hands and buttocks which has affected their concentration in class leading to a poor academic performance. Actually there was one people with Jigas all over even up to the, up, up to the elbow. You can see them like cow piece under the skin. Now, when I asked about the whole of this problem, that how do these jiggers come about? That's where I was told one, that jiggers are a sign of riches. Eh? In the community, that's the belief that people have. A number of students have as a result of the epidemic dropped out of school. These children who have a problem with the, the jiggers are not allowed to, to move freely to, move, to these places. And hence, it leads to drop out, rate to increase. The teachers are frustrated with the Jiga infestation and their pleas to parents to maintain hygiene in their homes have landed on deaf ears. Yeah. 
The resident district commissioner says jigger infections are prevalent across the district. So if in the town council they have jiggers, that means in the rural areas it is worse. And the problem of the jiggers is emanating from the homes they come from. They have a very funny belief that, you know, jiggers come from uh, uh, ant hills, that they fly like grasshoppers. Then others believe, have a very bad belief and a very funny belief. They claim that the more jiggers you have, the more wealth you will have in future. So this is a very, very bad belief. Then others are claiming that uh, because there is no Chabazinga, that's why they have jiggers. District leaders plan to carry out a massive sensitization exercise aimed at the eradication of the epidemic. Kampala Capital City Authority has introduced a raft of reforms aimed at streamlining the operation of taxi motorbikes, whom we, which we normally call border borders. Among the changes is the mandatory wearing of marked reflector jackets and helmets by all registered riders. <laughs> We have close to 60,000 uh, people that registered motorcycles. We have been uh, building a database. We have cleaned it. We have also uh, initiated the process for the code of conduct that will guide operations of uh, these border borders. And um, in there, we'll have um, uh, things like the green zones, uh, red zones. Green zones meaning they can ride in these areas. Red zones meaning they cannot be allowed in these areas. So we're working out the final detail on um, what the, the numbers were. We're now going to take a short break, but NTV at One continues shortly, so do stay with us. Power theft can not only cause destruction of properties and power outages, but can also lead to death. This is today's Umeme outage report. To improve supply stability, maintenance was carried out in the following areas today. Speak up and report power theft. It's a crime and affects everyone. Let's unite against power theft and save lives. On the next episode of Two Way. Sofio uh, White Nairo. Tebidi Komiaka kickboxing. Ah, Tebidi Komiaka. Tebidi Komiaka. Uga so kule guba ili kwa wa. Miaka vile muna nanti ya ya. Biko de bievi guba mu. Uga so wanga vile nzikuku wa na manyo kuzi. Uga nzewe na impo ye. Wala ya gambia jia kukuba. Na umuchala mutuwa. Ah, teke zeti ziru ma. Zeti ziti ya. Tuwa ye. Welcome back from that short break. Thank you for watching NTV. Now we continue with NTV at one. It has been over two years since the murder of businessman Wilberforce Swamala. With the numbers of those murdered registering a sharp rise in the country, there is fear that Wamala's killers continue to roam freely. There is a glaring, glaring evidence of Roni Barrier. But she is yet to get justice. In the first part of the series, Murder Most Foul, we bring you the chilling narrative of how Wamala was murdered. General Ronda Nyakaima and other intelligence body director generals. However, why has the process of prosecution stalled and yet there appears to be a lot of incriminating evidence? With conspiracy theories abound, is there a deliberate effort to scuttle the process of investigation. On the dawn of February 3rd, 2002, in what appeared to be a carefully choreographed plot to eliminate Wamala that morning, his killers sought help inside his palatial home. 
a young man who worked at Wamala's home as a painter, Hasim Sali allegedly carried out wrecking at the house before the murder. Once they gained access inside the house, the assailant struck killing the house help, Sadiq Mugera camera and documentation which included architectural plans for the Muyenga site where he was constructing flats. Once a vibrant home that transpired that day is the driver of the late Wamala, Ben Ziwa, conspicuously did not turn up to pick his master. His mobile phone was switched off for the greater part of the day. That evening, he took his mobile handset off him and asked him, and I mean, he looked through his call log and he noticed that he had not attempted to call my husband even once, but uh, was on the way on to Masaka. So the painter was called upon. The OC station called him and said to him that we would like to speak to you about Mr. Wamala's death. He switched off. His phone was switched off from that day. In the aftermath of the murder, the chief investigating officer, John William O'Callaghan, apprehended the driver Ziwa as the chief suspect. <laughs> But as detectives began to Wamala, and what was the motive? Did his business partners do him in over property? Was it as a result of the wrangling in his domestic relations? I mean, they came in and killed him and took nothing, absolutely nothing, and left the house intact. And yet, after his death, three days later after he's buried, in fact, two days later, people come into this house. I was here and they started counting everything from these cushions to the smallest that money is being deposited into somebody else's, ba else's personal bank account. However, his widow, Elizabeth Kigozi Wamala, who has traversed the corridors of power to seek justice, says there has been a deliberate plot by police officers to frustrate. Because of his involvement, he was the only person that acted professionally Ginger Road Police Station, and the day I turned up at the police station once to complain about this home being locked up by security and me being prevented from coming in. Even if it means putting her life in harm's way. Nobody gets away with murder, especially a, a murder most horrid like my husband. People need to understand that there are international agencies that can get involved in investigating such murders. I've got an opportunity and exhaust the services here, and if they fail, then they'll be ready to step in. But those she accuses claim perhaps her emotional outpouring and her keen interest in this case is a pretext to conceal a crime she committed herself, an accusation she denies. In the second part of the series, Madame Mosfau will reveal how Elizabeth Kigozi Wamala hires private detectives to trace an alleged accomplice in the murder. When the accomplice is found and confesses to helping the killers, what later unravels bears the hallmarks of a soft skated mafia that delivers a dire warning to all those who are searching for the truth. Be sure to catch our second episode of Murder Most Foul in NTV, Kusawe Muan, NTV Weekend Edition. Let's go to our international news where Ukrainian officials have warned Russia that any military intervention will lead to war. The warning comes on the heels of a meeting by NATO to discuss Ukraine's situation. The West has condemned Russia's decision to deploy troops in Ukraine. Ambassador, how concerned are you about the situation? Very deeply. We need de-escalation. Ukraine has put its armed forces on full combat alert and warned Moscow that military intervention will lead to war after the upper house of Russia's parliament gave President Vladimir Putin the authority to invade. After a more than three-hour meeting with security and defense chiefs, Alexander Tashinov, Ukraine's interim president, said there was no justification for what he called Russian aggression against his country. Ukraine's prime minister said he had urged Russia to return its troops to base in the Crimea region during a phone call with Dmitry Medvedev, Russia's prime minister, and called for talks. 
The Federation Council, the upper house of the Russian parliament, voted overwhelmingly on Saturday to back a proposal by Putin to use the armed forces of the Russian Federation on the territory of Ukraine until Ukraine's normalization of the socio-political situation. Samantha Power, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., said that Russia's parliamentary approval was destabilizing and accused Moscow of acting without legal basis. This intervention is without legal basis. Indeed, it violates Russia's commitment to protect the sovereignty, territorial integrity, and independence of Ukraine. Why did this problem need to result in demonstrations? Why is it that these street demonstrations need to be encouraged from abroad, encouraged by people from the EU? Putin and U.S. President Barack Obama held a 90-minute telephone call on Saturday in which the Russian president told his counterpart that Russia reserves the right to protect its interests and those of Russian speakers if there is violence in East Ukraine or Crimea. Pull back your forces. Uh, let us engage in political dialogue. Engage with the Ukrainian government which is reaching out to you. Washington has said it will suspend participation in preparatory meeting for the G8 summit in Sochi, Russia, planned for this summer. In a statement issued after an emergency cabinet meeting on Saturday, Canada's Prime Minister said he had also suspended his country's participation. Ukraine's new government, which came to power after the all-single Viktor Yanukovych has called for fresh presidential elections on May 25th, a move opposed by the administration in Crimea. The interim government has issued an arrest warrant for Yanukovych, accusing him of being responsible for the deaths of at least 70 protesters on February 21st protests in Kiev. Meanwhile, away from Crimea, there are signs of unrest in other parts of the country. Thousands of pro-Russian protesters gathered in the eastern city of Kharkiv on Saturday and denounced the new government in Kiev and called for unification with Russia. In sports news, Uganda has stepped up its training for the Lacrosse World Cup Championship that is slated for the 9th of July in the United States of Denver. The national team is undergoing rigorous drilling at um, the Makere University Business School pitch, hoping to become the first team to win the World Cup on fast asking. Uganda is the only African country that will be participating in the championship, expected to attract 40 national teams across the world. Sam Poza with that story. Uganda will make history this July when they become the first African country to participate in the Lacrosse World Cup. Uganda qualified to represent Africa in the World Championship by virtue of being the only lacrosse playing country in Africa. They will join eight other countries competing in the championship for the first time, including China, Colombia, Costa Rica, Israel, Russia, Thailand and Turkey. Despite playing at the world level for the first time, Uganda's coach Andrew Boston is determined his men will surprise their opponents in the group, who include Ireland, France and Bermuda. We've taken the first couple steps of learning the fundamentals. And now it's teaching strategy. And the idea is if we can go out there and be the toughest team, then we have a chance. We're not going to Denver simply to play. We are going to Denver to win. Uganda takes on Ireland in the opening game on 9th July in a match Boston believes will be a do or die affair. Ireland is a big team. They are a fast team. What makes this team from Uganda special as well is that all men are from Uganda. Many of these teams will use college players from the United States that are of that nationality to represent their team. For Uganda, we have no Ugandan lacrosse players right now in America. So the team that comes will be the team that plays. A group of 22 players are currently undergoing periodic training sessions at the Makerere Business School, hoping to further step it up as the championship grows closer. A record 38 countries have confirmed participation in the championship, aiming at dethroning reigning champions USA. USA won the 2010 edition held in Manchester, England, after defeating Canada by 12 to 10 goals. That story winds up NTV at 1. Thank you so much for watching. From the entire team and those behind the scenes, it's a great afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 
This is the news beat presented to you by Lady Sly and Survivor. Follow, follow the beat, follow the beat from the studio to the street. Info with the flow, keep you sharpening in the know. Sit back, relax, enjoy the news. Follow. Out there in Europe, there's a revolution. People in Ukraine took the world's attention. 80 people died fighting the oppression. Despite the government snipers and Russian insiders without use of a gun, they sent President Yanukovych on the run. Opposition leaders were free, people relieved, hope restored, the whole world watching indeed. When people unite to fight, no power can resist a popular plight. Zimbabwe's Mugabe just turned 90, aging on but still feeling mighty. Spent time in prison like Madiba and later on became a state leader. From a prisoner to a revolutionary to the legendary headstrong adversary. He fought for the people, a right to be free. Highly educated with seven college degrees, one million dollars for his birthday celebration. I assure our president got his invitation. For 34 years still the man of the hour. Since 1980 still the man in power. Send us your mini skirts, says women in Tanzania. Obviously, we don't need them anymore. Ethics committee says this law was fast race under Idi Amin's regime. The recent law leaves too many blanks. People could take justice into their own hands. That's what happened to a lady in a bee. She wore a mini skirt and got assaulted for indecency. Dragged on the floor with no respect for humanity. A strange behavior in the 21st century. For the most part of the human history, the dress code was just simple nudity. Let's hope we can all respect the law and the law can also see the difference between freedom to dress and a road to excess. What a brilliant idea the East African community. Good for business, peace and prosperity. History shows that things work better when neighbors come and work together for the better. Like the Europeans used to fight wars and now it's open borders, open doors and shores. That's a good philosophy but a true federation is still a fantasy. The East African community was Uganda. Kenya, Tanzania in 1967, Burundi and Rwanda in 2007 joined the community in unity. Members are now free to cross from border to border without a passport. Good news for the tourists, a merry-go-round. All you need is one visa to move around. That was the news on the beat. Next week will be another hit. Still let it slide. And Survivor. Reporting live and direct with love and respect. Follow the beat, follow the beat, follow the beat, follow the beat. Follow the beat. Follow the beat, follow the beat, follow the beat, follow the beat. Follow the beat.